preços ao nível de mercado do PIB, será equivalente ao preço atualizado dos instrumentos detidos pelo PIB? Só para dizer. Good time. And uh, it's a uh, great honor for us to have tonight uh, Dr. Sam Moss from Stanford, California. In California, it's, it's good afternoon. It's uh, four hours early. Uh, uh, we would like to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sam Moss, for accepting our invitation and join us tonight. It's really a great pleasure. I know all your efforts to stay with us during this night. And my very special thanks to uh, our panelists for all parts of, accept our invitation from different parts of the country. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bomegiano will be the moderator of this section. Camila, uh, our chronic coordinator of our international live streams. And Marcel, of course, our translator. So uh, from now, we have approximately uh, 50 minutes, between approximately 50 minutes for uh, some most talk. And then after, Dr. Leonardo Bomegiano will be coordinated, will be moderate, uh, discussion from the panelists, uh, questions and comments, and of course, questions from the audience. Please, uh, Dr. Bomegiano, is your time. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Aldo, for this opportunity. And it's a great honor that Dr. Sam Most accepts my invitation by Instagram. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm very glad for this. It's the modern times, I guess. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists. Uh, I start with Natalia Coronel. La Natalia was a uh, resident uh, on COF, on Dr. Aldo uh, service here in Sao Paulo. And he was my fellowship on, on rhinoplasty on the, university, on the Federal University of Sao Paulo. Uh, Dr. Jurado is from the, the Instituto Jurado here in Sao Paulo and former president of the Brazilian Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery. Uh, Dr. Patrocino from Uberlândia, Minas Gerais, also a former, former president of the Brazilian Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery. Uh, Dr. Marcelo Zanini from Rio Grande do Sul, it's on the south of Brazil, and was former president for the Agot, CCF, the Associação Gaúcha de Otorrino. And Dr. Washington Almeida from Bahia, also a former president of Brazilian Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery. So Dr. Sam Most is the chief of the facial plastic surgery on the Stanford University, this beautiful campus behind him and <laughs> you present us with uh, this 50 minutes lecture. And after this, I will make some questions and all of the audience could make questions by the chat or by the Q&A button here down the, the screen. Thank you again, Dr. Most. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's an honor. Um, you know, I'm getting used to doing these lectures, but it's always much more fun to be in person, but it's very good to see all your faces. Uh, many of you I know from before. I want to thank off, thank Dr. S uh, Dr. Stam for inviting me very much. I'm honored to be a speaker. And uh, I'm going to try to share a screen here now and make sure this works. Yep. <clears throat> just one second. I'm just going to explain the interpretation. Please. Um, in português. So, uh, pessoal, quem quiser ouvir em português a versão traduzida, é só clicar nesse mundinho que tem aqui embaixo e colocar, na, colocar no português, que vai ouvir o áudio traduzido, e no inglês o áudio original. Tá bom? Yes, doctor? Thank you very much. Um, let's Sorry. just make sure this works again. Thank you very much for having me. So, I'm at a point in my career now, almost 20 years uh, since I finished my training where I can uh, think and reflect a little bit on uh, how my practice has evolved and a little bit of philosophy. So um, I appreciate you asking me to, to talk a little bit about that uh, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, is that working now? Did it yeah. advance? Okay, good, thank you. This is my contact information. Um, I have permission from all my patients to use them on, uh, on the web and everything. So screenshots are okay, but just make sure accreditation is appropriate. Uh, I have no disclosures except uh, just again, I am from San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and but this is a uh, picture was actually taken uh, in Florianopolis uh, three years ago with Dr. Petrosinio. I, I was walking uh, with him to dinner and we saw this place, San Francisco Burgers. So 
I always remember this moment. It was a great time a few years ago. My only trip to Brazil, hopefully there will be more in the future. Um, just a quick uh, plug for our, our series of webinars that we're doing um, every Saturday morning. Everybody is invited, it's free. We're doing uh, one on complications in rhinoplasty this week. Uh, and I don't think it interferes with any of the other uh, webinars that are out there. Uh, but so, you know, in thinking about this, I always like to show this definition of rhinoplasty from the dictionary, which basically says it is plastic surgery on the nose for cosmetic purposes. And <clears throat> that's, that's really just not the right way to think about it because as we know, um, those of us who've been doing this, and I think most people who are trained nowadays, understand that it is plastic surgery on the nose that in, involves functional and aesthetic considerations in every single patient, even patients who are purely functional. You have to think about the aesthetic aspects of things because the three defining components of nasal surgery, which are you know, this, the external lining, the internal lining, and then the bony cartilaginous framework, which is primarily, but not the only thing we work on, but primarily what we do, um, all affect both aesthetics and function. And the aesthetics of the nose are essentially the way light and shadow hits the nose. We're, we're changing the aesthetics of the nose by changing those shadow lines to a more aesthetically pleasing form. Uh, and the function is basically the space in the airway. And it's always a tension and a balance between these two in every single surgery that we do. Um, I, I just wanna really emphasize that. And, and I wanna spend a little bit of time at the beginning talking about the functional aspects of surgery. This could be, of course, an entire lecture, but I wanna talk about a little bit about my philosophy for it uh, and, and what I think are some of the salient aspects that uh, unfortunately sometimes uh, we don't use. First is, how do we measure nasal obstruction? And by the way, I do this in every single patient, not just in patients who complain of nasal breathing. Um, we have three primary modalities for evaluating nasal obstruction uh, when we look at patients and for measuring them. First are physical measures, quantitative measures. And I'm not a big fan of these, I'll just say that right now. So. Um, I'm not sure what your practices are like, but here in the US probably we don't use quantitative measures of the nasal airway very much. And one reason uh, is the following. Um, this is a graph that on the uh, left axis shows uh, a subjective measure of nasal obstruction, what the patient complains about. This is the nose score, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then the bottom is nasal peak flow. So how much air is flowing through the nose? So a high nose score is bad, a low nose score is good. So looking at this, one might expect that as you drift from left to right, increasing flow would mean lower scores on the nose questionnaire. So you might expect some sort of correlation like this uh, when you see this. And, and the, the problem is that this data that I'm showing you isn't the real data. If you look at the real paper, uh, which is on the bottom left by one of my colleagues from when I was uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle, there's no correlation whatsoever between nasal airflow and what patients feel, unfortunately. So you can measure nasal airflow if you want, but it doesn't necessarily correlate with symptomatically what patients are feeling. So I don't really do that. Um, I do do patient-derived measures, which are the subjective measures like the nose questionnaire shown uh, on the left side of that screen. And this is a classic questionnaire that was done by uh, Mickey Stewart back in 2004. It was one of the very first truly well-validated uh, questionnaires uh, that was meant for otolaryngology. And it was validated for septoplasty and terminate reduction. And it's really the gold standard for nasal obstruction. Many of you probably use it. It's been translated into Portuguese and multiple other languages. The problem is it's, it's not really made for rhinoplasty patients. It has no aesthetic measures whatsoever. Uh, and so, you know, in my career, and now I can act philosophical here, I have over the years tried to do things that I think are going to make a difference for our specialty and for how we treat patients. Uh, and one of the things that I really wanted to do, and I've tried twice before I got it right, was to create a questionnaire that is simple to use, highly, highly validated, um, and we can use for rhinoplasty patients, functional and aesthetic both. Uh, and so that's called the SHNAS, which is uh, the Standardized uh, Cosmesis Health Nasal Outcome Survey. Um, and it's 10 questions. 
and everybody gets it. Every patient gets it. I don't use the nose questionnaire anymore. Uh, and so when I show you patients, I'm going to, if, if this is only about four years old, if I have this data, I will show you this data in addition to their results physically. And by the way, uh, Roberto Tunis and, and Lucas Patrocinio translated this into Portuguese. Uh, and it was published in our, our premier journal, Facial Plastic Surgery and Aesthetic Medicine, uh, which I'm an, an associate editor of, so I, have a, I guess that's sort of a conflict, uh, but I'm going to plug that journal. Um, so I would, you know, highly recommend everybody use this. It only takes a few seconds for patients to answer it. And even if you're not using it for research, it really makes a difference in your practice when you do this. And finally, the thing that really probably drove me the most crazy was some of the grading systems and things that we use and some of the classifications we use for nasal obstruction uh, that I've sort of changed over the years. Um, the, the, you know, the, the nomenclature, I'm sorry, that's a blurry slide. That's from the consensus statement from our academy from about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, was that there's this internal nasal valve and external nasal valve. And you know, this is what we learn in residency. Many of you probably learned this. And to me, this nomenclature is just, just not good. Um, you know, we learn about septum turbinates and valves. There are septal classification systems and things like that. I don't find them very useful. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what I find useful here in a second. When I think about nasal anatomic nasal obstruction, I'm not talking about allergic nasal disease or anything like that. When you think about anatomic nasal destruction, there's two things to think about on one side, whether it's dynamic, whether it's static. In other words, whether it's due to something in motion, due to negative inspiratory pressure, or whether it is static and doesn't move. And finally, whether it is medial or lateral. Um, so for example, we can talk about static nasal obstruction. Um, medial statal, static nasal obstruction is due to septal deviation, which can cause narrowing of the internal valve. It can be caudal, it can be posterior. Um, and you know, that's classic sort of septal deviation. And then laterally, it can be a medialized bone, which is typically iatrogenic or inferior turbinate hypertrophy that's unresponsive to uh, medical therapy. When you think about septoplasty, again, classification systems aren't that important. What's really more important is how you're going to treat it. And, you know, if this dotted line is our, is our dividing line for preserving that L strut, and we want to we wanna use that as our, as our treatment sort of um, decision-making um, apparatus, everything to the posterior to that line can be treated with a standard septoplasty with a headlight, a mirror, endoscope. You can take anything out beyond, behind that safely without disrupting anything. But if the deviation is anterior to that in the dorsal strut, caudal strut, that has to be manipulated. And you can do it endonasally or externally. Um, but you can't try to leave that alone and expect things to get better. And my bias is that I'm a big proponent of extracorporeal septoplasty, as those of you who, who know me over the years know. Uh, and early in my career, um, after having watched uh, Wolfgang Gubisch talk about complete extracorporeal septoplasty, decided that there had to be something a little bit easier. Um, and so started doing what we call anterior septal reconstruction or near, near total uh, reconstruction and extracorporeal technique. And the idea here is that that upper dorsal segment is not really that important for the airway in most cases. Uh, and you can reconstruct the entire septum and leave that and use that as, as a, a base to secure your graft to um, so you don't have problems of notching and other problems that uh, Wolfgang has described very well up to 9% of his patients, and a lot of them he, he grafts on top. So this solves that issue. And in fact, when you get very facile with this, um, you can actually, uh, you, I do this at very low threshold for doing this, even in aesthetic rhinoplasty. If I think it's off, I just take it out and I just rebuild it. And so we published many papers on this and outcomes and technical aspects of it. These are the two big ones. Um, and so uh, this to me is how I treat deviated caudal, caudal septal deviations in patients. Uh, and again, for me, when I think about septal deviation, it's anterior to that line, I do this. If it's posterior to that line, I, I just do a regular septoplasty. Um, I'm not gonna talk about lateralizing nasal bones and things like that, I think in the interest of time, but I wanna talk about some of, the, some of the things I used to classify 
uh, nasal obstruction in my mind and in my practice that are a little different. Um, here, when you're talking about dynamic um, narrowing of the nasal airway, negative inspiratory pressure due to a narrow uh, passageway and a weak lateral wall typically causes well, what I call lateral wall insufficiency. We're not going to talk about medial, the medial uh, insufficiency is very, very rare. I don't think it's really a big problem. Typically, dynamic uh, narrowing is due to lateral wall insufficiency. And that's a term that, that, uh, that, I, that actually I coined back in 2006, six seven um, because I did not like the term external valve collapse. Um, I think that it's more useful to think about insufficiency of the entire lateral wall, and it primarily occurs in one of two zones either in zone one, which is upper, which is more common. Um, I'd say this some degree of inspiratory collapse occurs in 80% of patients. The question is whether it's pathologic. And zone two collapse is usually iatrogenic or due to very cephalically oriented um, lower cartilages such that area is very weak. Uh, and we treat these differently. This is what internal, um, sorry, what, lo, uh, what um, zone one lateral wall insufficiency looks like. I don't usually use an endoscope, but I just wanted to show this. That's the scroll and the upper lateral cartilage that are falling in. And we validated a grading system for this too. Uh, and the grading system is, is very simple. If there's no movement, it's grade zero. One, two, three is one third, two thirds, or more than two thirds uh, movement towards the septum from wherever, whatever position it is. And this has been used in multiple studies. Uh, people like Dean and others now are using this. So the terms lateral wall insufficiency and the grading system have replaced external valve collapse. So I think, you know, a lot of people are starting to think of things this way, static, dynamic, medial, lateral. I think that's the way to think about anatomic nasal obstruction. And it makes sense for how you're going to treat uh, these patients. We analyzed how we treated these patients over the years. And I've tried many treatments for zone one um, collapse and zone two, and you know, in zone one, you can use bone anchored sutures, which is something I did early in my career and published about. But I really have come back around to thinking lateral curl strike grafting is the best way. I think it's better than batten grafting and other things like that. Um, that's my personal bias, but uh, zone two collapse really needs a non-anatomic rim graft placement to prevent that from falling, uh, falling in, and it's very efficacious. And that's shown in the bottom right-hand part of the screen. Um, so that's just a little bit about my, how I approach patients functionally. I think if you understand that, you probably understand pretty much my thinking uh, for all anatomic nasal uh, obstruction that comes through my doorway. And at this point, I, I get a lot of tertiary referrals and things like that with really severe caudal deviations after um, having had uh, septoplasties previously. So we end up doing rib graft, anterior septal reconstruction or things like that, and lateral curl uh, reconstruction. So um, but even in primary patients, that's a very useful way to think about things. But um, next, for, for the folks who are kind of maybe newer to rhinoplasty or, or don't do a lot of it, I think it's really important to understand uh, the importance of the tip tripod complex uh, for stabilizing tip and controlling uh, the tip for long-term stability and excellent result. And I, I was trained a certain way, and I'm, I'm going to talk about how my thinking's evolved a little bit, but um, we're talking about you know, rotation and projection, there are four primary aspects to the tip that you need to think about, and those are volume, geometry, rotation, projection. These are all related, but rotation and projection are the things that I, I want to talk about controlling when we talk about the tip tripod. And of course, Jack Anderson is the one who's credited with um, this concept of a tripod. And, and I, for the longest time, could not understand what they were talking about. The epiphany for me was when I realized that the uh, tripod the medial legs of the tripod are the paired medial cura, and, the, and that, that just didn't, didn't make sense to me. The two things were one, but they are. So the medial cura are essentially one leg of the tripod and the lateral cura are the other. And this is a stylized septum with uh, lower cartilages with medial cura, lateral cura, uh, and the intermediate cura demonstrated here in purple on the septum in blue. And you know, if you want to alter projection or rotation, the position on that septum uh, is going to give you a lot of control uh, over this. So you can you know, move it up and down in relation to that septum and have a lot of control of what you want to do with the tip. And in the beginning of my career, um, I used Collier struts because that was what I was told to do. And, you know, and they're fine, I think, for some people. But I, I found that aesthetically, I wasn't happy with what they were doing. 
at the, at the uh, labial angle. I wasn't thinking that I had as much control. And frankly, I think studies have shown that if you look very carefully at, at the way Collie Mallard struts work, they, they do have some problems. And not, not only that, they also annoy people because they can click. So when I started doing septal reconstructions a lot, those patients, of course, need a tongue and groove uh, technique to secure that new the neoseptum to the medial cura. And I then started moving that over to aesthetic patients. Uh, and I found that I had, I had much better long-term results uh, than I had previously. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of my philosophy here. And I think that, you know, this is another aspect of my practice, which is um, very important to me. And I, and I just wanna spend a little time talking about it. You know, people talk about when criticism of the tongue and groove method, which um, was really popularized by Cridell and Hassan Foda in a paper from about 20, 21 years ago, uh, is that it can, you can have decreased columellar show, retraction, or stiffness of the tip. There are ways to mitigate that, and I want to talk about that. You know, projection and rotation are the outcomes you really want to pay attention to, and columellar show is, is an aesthetic outcome you want to pay attention to in addition to those, and then stiffness is just something that you want to try to avoid as much as you can. Um, now, I tell patients their noses are going to be a little bit stiffer when we're done because they usually have a weak tip, uh, but you don't want it to be too stiff. And we published a couple of papers on the nuances of this. I'm not going to go into all the details, but what I do want to say is that depending on how you position your suture uh, point on the medial cruce and how you position it on the caudal septum, on an anterior posterior axis or uh, inferior superior axis, will change columellar show, rotation, projection, and stiffness. And sometimes I've in talks gone through all of these. I don't want to do that right now in the interest of time. But a couple points. One is that you can, because the medial cruise uh, rotates posteriorly, as you can see where the foot plate is, you can actually secure this way back there without changing uh, you know, the position of the columella. if you're really worried about that. Often I want to, anyway, I want to rotate up a little bit, but by positioning it down there, you won't, and it's much less stiff when you put it there because the whole springiness of the tip up above it is intact. The more, you, the more anteriorly towards the anterior septal angle you secure that suture, the, le the more stiff it's going to be because there's less springiness left. That's, that fixation point is really close to the tip. That's one thing. Another thing is that there's this thing that um, I wrote about in this paper that I don't think had been described previously, which is this normal angle of divergence between the posterior edge of the medial cruce and the caudal edge of the septum. Okay, so there's this normal angle. Everyone's a little different. In an Asian nose or an African nose, it might be wider because the septum is shorter. If you put the suture more towards the tip, you will rotate much, much more. You will over-rotate because you'll close that angle. Uh, and so we try to avoid putting sutures too far up there unless you want to do that to the septum. But uh, usually at the lower half or lower third of the, of the medial cruise is where you want your suture entry point to be. From a technical point of view, you have to make sure your distances from your entry point are the same. Uh, distance from the entry point to the caudal edge, shown on the left side of the screen, I don't think my arrow is working, but on the left side of the screen, the red dot, the lines MCE prime and MCE have to be the same on both sides. Just on both of my rhinoplasties I did today, they were different, the, the medial curve were different sizes. That doesn't matter as long as the amount that's showing caudally is the same, it will have a symmetric contour and the distance to the tip defining point, which is MC-TDP on both of those have to be the same. So these are things that are somewhat intuitive, but I think needed to be explained. And I, I in two papers, we've written about this and there's a video that accompanies this um, that, that kind of explains it. I'm gonna show a case here. So this is a patient who among other things has a very totic tip, but asymmetric medial curl contour uh, due to something like this. And uh, so what we're gonna do is really use the tongue and groove technique to, to secure that uh, and make sure that we have a symmetric contour line uh, for that patient. So here he is, a uh, very totic tip and really wants the tip addressed and the slight twist to the patient's right, which is the left side of the screen addressed. And um, you can see how much drop he has. So, you know, I did a small dorsal hip reduction um, and lateral curl overlay, which helped rotate him. 
Uh, and a few other things like clocking suture, which Baman Gairans described, uh, septoplasty, and tongue and groove to make sure these things are more symmetric. Okay. Uh, and this is a lateral curl overlay, which again, Russ Cridell, I think, is really the one who showed. And I want to show this video. This isn't that patient, but I want to show how this entry point distance, those green lines have to be the same on the first side as they are on the second side. And then you do the suture entry into the septum. I'm going to skip that just for interest time. Now here, you're going to see, I think it should freeze or maybe it won't. The distances should be the same here as they are on the other side. Okay, so this will make sure you're, you're, you're symmetric. So these are the major variables to consider. Suture position on the medial cruise, suture position on the septum. Um, and this is the patient postoperatively a year out, uh, showing you know, better tip rotation. He's got more symmetric positioning on an you know, anterior, anterior posterior axis of the tip and also caudally uh, the medial curve are more symmetric. I'm gonna show him smiling here. I think he doesn't drop like he used to. Uh, and he still has a masculine nose. He was very happy with that. Just wanted, he just wanted that kind of stuff fixed. But it's a very powerful technique for doing that. Also narrowed his tip a little bit. Uh, this is a revision case. So all these things come into play for that too. Uh, this patient is very retracted uh, and shortened nose. And so you can use this uh, tripod concept to understand you've got to push that whole tripod down in her uh, to get this to, to look appropriate. Uh, she'd been overshortened by her prior rhinoplasty. And so she actually was missing her lateral cura, which isn't really the point of this uh, this part of the talk, but luckily she had enough septal cartilage to do the complete reconstruction. Uh, and in this case, we're going to use our tripod concept to push the tripod uh, inferiorly caudally to give her back her normal uh, length with a septal extension graft. And um, so this is just you know pretty basic. This is going to show how we do septal extension grafting. I uh, I do this uh, side to side. And we actually have a paper which is going to be coming out uh, later this year, uh, doing a cohort analysis of patients who we've done this in to show that we actually don't cause any nasal obstruction with this. So when you're when you're doing this appropriately, you shouldn't cause any nasal obstruction. Uh, there's that's one of the criticisms of this technique. People like to do it end to end, which I find is less stable and tends to twist one side or the other. So as long as you make sure you do this, and when I do this, I'm marking the philtrum and making sure this is truly in the midline. Um, then uh, you should be fine. And just check the airway, of course, when you're done and make sure that this caudal edge of this is sitting in the midline. And then you do your tongue and groove to that. So this is, this is our patient uh, lateral curl reconstruction. Um, and so you can see when you push the whole tripod down, you can really length, re-lengthen the nose and put it back into the appropriate position. This is end to side, sorry, end side to side uh, um, SEG. Uh, and the bossa are improved as well. This is a close up, very slight tip asymmetry, but she's doing well. She's over a year out. And sometimes the tip has dropped because the tripod is detached from the septum and needs to be replaced. So this tripod concept, again, now we're wanting to shorten it back into position because it wasn't secured appropriately. And so in this case, it is using the tongue and groove lateral curl overlay to shorten a little bit, but primarily tongue and groove to get this back into position in addition to a few other things. This is one of those rare cases where I, where I used homologous rib, almost never do that. And here he is uh, postoperatively and uh, nose is shortened to the appropriate position uh, and uh, dorsum is augmented as well. Three quarters view and base view. Okay, um, I know there's a lot of uh, talk, including by me about preservation rhinoplasty and all that. Um, and I know that Brazil is one of the places, um, I guess every place outside of the United States that was kept alive. <laughs> uh, there were very few caudal disciples uh, in the United States um, and more are coming back. But um, so I wanna talk about the fact that the Joseph pump reduction is a viable method uh, and it should not be completely abandoned. And I still use it in about 40% of my cases. Um, and this is, I'm very lucky to actually have a copy of uh, Jacques Joseph's book translated into English. Uh, so obviously it's not an original and, and it's, it's really fascinating to look through this book. I've got it right behind me here actually here on the Stanford campus, but um, very nice results that he shows uh, using saws and such, taking the dorsum off. Uh, and you know, with the Joseph uh, method, we're just doing our standard component resection and osteotomies to close things up. But 
I think it's important to look at cross-sectional anatomy and understand really what's happening here. Because when you take this top off, it's very destructive. It also looks very unnatural unless you can appropriately close this. Um, and I think that's one of the big advantages of the preservation method. So when you do this, you have to uh, then go ahead and do osteotomies to close this uh, open roof and this flat top. And sometimes you actually even have to resect bone uh, at the top there where I'm showing the medial osteotomies um, because it's, there's too much thickness there and it won't close. And you, you're trying to get something like this. You're trying to reconstruct that mid vault, which you have to do. If you don't, we know that we're gonna get airway compromise uh, and inverted V deformities aesthetically. So, oh, that was pretty cool the way those boxes did that. I didn't intend to do that, but anyway, they did that. So um, we actually looked at this and compared it to, uh, compared this method to preservation rhinoplasty, both push down and let down, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, and saw that, you know, basically on CT scan and cadavers, we are able to preserve the airway if you do appropriate mid vault reconstruction in these patients. So one of the things that you hear people who only do preservation rhinoplasty talk about um, is that it, it preserves the airway better than the Joseph pump reduction, which may be true if you're not reconstructing the mid vault. But if you do an appropriate mid vault reconstruction, the airway should be good. It, it should be really fine. So I, I don't really think of that as a primary indication for doing preservation rhinoplasty, at least if you're doing mid vault reconstruction, but you should do mid vault reconstruction anyway if you're doing Joseph Hump reduction. So um, we did find that if you did a push down rhinoplasty and you didn't resect bone, which is the middle one there in the bottom, you did block the airway. So if you're pushing, pushing it in and not resecting bone, doing a letdown, you actually will block the nasal airway. So we highly recommend either letdown or Joseph reduction, not push down um, for, uh, for patients. Um, and so this is just showing the summary of that study. And in, in a push down, we saw internal valve area was decreased, but in letdown or in Joseph with auto spreaders, which is what I used in those patients, the internal valve area was preserved. Uh, so it's really um, shows that there's really not a true advantage. Granted, this was a small group uh, to doing the uh, doing a Joseph or a letdown, uh, but if you're doing pr properly, the airway should be okay. And you know, just a couple of Joseph um, patients, sorry, this is, uh, let me go backwards here. It's a patient with a totic tip, wide tip, slight asymmetry. Uh, and um, you know, this is a case from eight, nine years ago that I did. Um, standard stuff, dome sutures and mid vault reconstruction is very important. And like I said, I use auto spreaders. I score the cartilage. I use a single suture at the bottom, as you see there. Uh, and I hinge the upper lateral cartilages inwards. Um, and, you know, people have various techniques, ways of doing this. They can fold the cartilage rather than score it, which I can understand the advantages of. Some people save, save the perichondrium uh, and then suture it over the top. I think Nazim Circus likes to do that. You know, I think we have to do what works for you. Um, and this, this has worked for me. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. And we showed using the nose questionnaire, because this is back in 2010 or 11, that this preserves the nasal airway as shown in the left panel in cosmetic patients whose nose scores preoperatively and postoperatively in black and white are shown to be stable. And on the right side, patients who had hump reductions who also had a septoplasty or something else did much better also, we fixed their airways. So this is just showing that. And here he is, uh, this is one year postoperatively. Here is seven or eight years postoperatively, um, maintaining everything. His, he's a little bit wider, which I actually think is fine for him. And that's one of the things from Joseph. The Joseph method here is one year, here he is, uh, seven or eight years uh, post-op, face view. Uh, and you know, this is another type of patient that you would never be able to do with a preservation rhinoplasty. Um, long nasal bones, very kyphotic. That's the most, probably as kyphotic as I think you can get with, your, with a dorsal hump. And so totic tip, uh, asymmetric tip, very wide. Uh, and you know, you're gonna have a lot of extra skin actually when you're done with this too. And so in her, and she was more recently in the last three or four years, I use the piezo, which is a new thing I'm not going to talk about too much, but it's something that I use all the time now. Um, and uh, took down a very large hump and used double spreader grafts because it was so wide once it was taken down that low, you can imagine, I really had to try to make sure it was stable, not let it collapse into the nose uh, and try to reconstruct her dorsal aesthetic lines with all that thick skin on the dorsum. Um, and here she is on the operating table, really big change. 
Uh, and here she is one year postoperatively. Um, and I think you'll see that dorsal aesthetic lines are still a work in progress for her on her frontal view. Even though uh, she's narrower in the tip, the width over the dorsum and that thick skin still are going to, I think, settle down as she ages. And I think it's going to look great, uh, even better as time goes on. Already looks great, I think, for her. She's very happy. And here's her base view. And this is her uh, uh, bird's eye view. And since I have her scores, because she's a more recent patient, I'll show you. This is what she was preoperatively. The top four scores are breathing obstruction. The bottom five are aesthetic. And after surgery, uh, this is what she looks like. So she's doing quite well. Again, this is a demonstration of how this, uh, this Schnauz score can be useful for you in your practice. And I, I feel blind if I don't walk into the room having seen that before I see a consult or a postoperative patient. It really helps me understand what's going on. And, and finally, you know, I think a, a concept isn't just structural preservation rhinoplasty, which is something new that I'm going to talk about, a new, a new, newish way of thinking about things. Um, I think an important idea for residents and fellows to understand is that um, you shouldn't be practicing the same way in 20 years as you are now. Um, question the things that you see and, and try to do new things that you think will work for your patients cautiously. Um, don't experiment, but you know, learn from others and adapt to your practice because so much of what I've told you already, almost all of it, is not the way I was trained. It's, it's stuff that I've uh, learned and from others and adapted and changed a little bit along the way. And I think that's an important lesson. And for me, I've been watching people talk about preservation. It wasn't called preservation. And you know, I was watching uh, um, Jose Juan and, uh, and Fausto from Mexico City talk about this for 15, 16 years. Um, and I thought, that looks crazy. <laughs> uh, and you know, really in the last few years, I, I started becoming more convinced um, because I was seeing external approaches to this. Uh, and so I, I, I started adapting it uh, a while ago and, and published our first paper on this um, in a, a way that I like to do the septum um, that helps me by a full external approach. And we have a, a book coming out on this later this year. And you know, Yves Saban uh, and Cottle have their ways of doing this, the septum. Uh, and after trying that um, over a year ago for, for a few patients, I decided I wanted to do something else, um, which was to save a strip underneath the dorsum, but most importantly, preserve the caudal strut. Because as you saw from earlier, that's a very important part of my practice in rhinoplasty. I didn't want to uh, do what Barish and other people do, which is just totally ignore that, cut, you know, do other things to it. Um, I wanted to save it and save my tongue and groove and all the things I do to the tip as I have experience with that and I'm comfortable with it and adapt it to a way to preserve the osteocartilaginous vault and take the advantages of that and adapt it to my own approach to external rhinoplasty. And so doing it this way is what I found worked for me, which is doing a subdorsal strip uh, and we call it the modified subdorsal strip method. This variable resection will, will depend on what you want to do, how you want to drop the patient. Um, for example, I did a severe tension nose the other day where the, the upper part needed to barely be dropped, but this, the part, the, the very anterior part of the septum needed to drop about eight millimeters. And so I took a triangular wedge even more wide than that, and it just dropped right into position. So you can adapt the way you cut this out. You need to make this cut uh, to allow it to flex down and the osteotomy should be incomplete. Um, and so suture control of the dorsum with 4 PDS. You can go transmucosal in the nose, which makes it a lot easier because sometimes this will cheese wire, cut right through the septum uh, if you don't do it, if there's any tension on it. So this is the way I like to do this. Now, I'm just gonna point this out. I've been doing this for about five or six months. And then last summer I was talking to uh, Carlos, who you know very well, who said he's doing something like this called the, he calls it the Tetris. And uh, it's interesting how it's a little different, but it's somewhat similar. And actually uh, other people have other versions of this that they do, but this is the way I do it. And this is what I call it. And so you can actually resect some septum and use it and save this T-strut. So you can use septum and do cartilage grafts. Obviously, if you have a high septal deviation in this area that you need to take care of, you can't do this. You can actually then do something like this, where you actually do an anterior septal reconstruction with the T-strut. Now, if you imagine all the septums removed, 
except for that T-strut. And then you put a, a anterior septal reconstruction graft in the front, like I showed earlier, with spreader grafts. I've done several of those cases, which we're going to publish later this year also. I'm not showing those in the interest of time. So you can do just about anything. So these are the different ways of doing it, depending on how you want to resect the septum. But the osteocartilaginous vault part is the same. Uh, we do a letdown. I think that's the best way for the nasal airway. Um, and so this is a diagram showing how this works, this modified subdorsal strip method. And the caudal strut is key to structural preservation. And now I'm calling this open rhinoplasty approach, whereby we save the osteocartilaginous vault um, with a preservation method, and then do everything the way we normally do on the tip, structural preservation rhinoplasty. Uh, and so it's, like I said, preservation of the osteocartilaginous vault of the nose and manipulation of the tip tripod complex with open structural techniques. Um, and it's, it's the way I do things now uh, when I'm doing dorsal hump reduction in patients who are appropriate for preservation. So in the septum, you can do septal extension grafts, Collie-Meller struts if you prefer that, anterior septal reconstruction like I just explained. Uh, on the lateral wall, you can do lateral curl strut grafting, mini lateral curl strut grafting, which we described earlier this year. Lateral curl overlay, you can do cephalic turn-ins, uh, rim grafts, articulated rim grafts if you want. Any, all those things you like to do if you like to do that. You don't have to give it all up. You can just combine preservation of that dorsum because you like the dorsal aesthetic lines, you don't want to disrupt them with all of these techniques, which, which is what I really like. In the tip, again, all the things you like to do. Um, uh, so, so anything you like to do, you can, you can continue to do with this method. This is uh, a patient with slight asymmetry of the dorsum, um, but overall, her tip is fine. I'll point out her left tip defining points more refined than her right, and it still shows up post-op. Um, here we did the modified subdorsal strip method. We dropped it into position with dual suturing, uh, and the, the letdown, where we drop the whole thing into position like so. This is uh, an image showing in the operating room that caudal strut being preserved. This is a video showing a little strip coming out. And then being sutured into place, I use a PDS. So you can see how you can drop it into position. That new dorsum, those dorsal aesthetic lines are preserved. And then this, of course, is trimmed after you finish up your work with your tip. So that caudal point that's sticking up does not stay. Maybe the anterior septal angle might, but the rest of it doesn't. Depends on what you want to do. And this is a side view showing that. So you can do your tongue and groove and all that stuff and secure it to that strut. Now you can even put spreader grafts in there if you want underneath those, um, those lower lats. And so this is what we did for her, which is fairly straightforward. She needed no tip work. Um, and a single suture was used in her. And here she is on the operating table. Uh, and here she is six months. In fact, she's supposed to come for her one year visit next week. So I'll see her soon, um, but I don't anticipate any problems. I know she's doing very well. And you know, the dorsal aesthetic lines are so well preserved with this osteocartilaginous fault work, uh, lack of you know, disrupting it. I just, I just really love that. And that's been a game changer for me. And the other part is not giving up everything else that I like to do with these patients in the tip. And you know, her preoperative and postoperative SNOS scores show her airways preserved and she's very happy aesthetically. Another patient, structural preservation. Um, in her, the, the tip work that we did I wanna show is lateral curl overlay. So I can do that tongue and groove uh, and um, do everything else. There's a slight step at her radix and so I had to put a little cartilage graft there. My incidence of those steps is going down as I, as I get, I become more careful with how I treat that transverse osteotomy. I think that's an important thing to think about. Uh, and this is our lateral curl overlay we talked about. And here she is post-op, uh, profile, three quarters view. I also did ailer base resections in her, by the way. And here she is on her frontal view and base view. And she has a little bit of stuffiness, um, but I think it's allergic related. We're watching it, but it's not really a problem for her. But again, I like to show you quantitatively what's going on with these patients in addition to the aesthetic results um, that you see on the screen. Another patient, this is interesting because she has a, a crooked uh, nose, but it's a straight deviation to her, le to her left, our right. And so in these cases, you can use the modified subdorsal strip method but you can do an asymmetric letdown. Many people have described this. This isn't, this isn't anything I'm innovating at all, but it's a very interesting idea to be able to shift the whole thing over and you can actually measure the nasal bones and do the appropriate um, osteotomy on each, ostectomy on one side only so it drops to that side. 
Uh, and so this is just marking. I'm going to try to speed through these just in the interest of time. This is a marking on each side so you can see. And then you can measure once you get that midline measure. This is high speed, by the way. I don't, I don't work that fast. Um, measure how much. And so you can see the ostectomy I'm going to do on, on the left side of the screen or the right side of the patient. And using the piezo tome, um, sorry, the views from above, you can't quite see where the cuts were made, but an ostectomy is going to be performed on the patient's right side and allow this to drop into position. And I think in a second here, I'm going to show the bone coming out in slow motion. There you go. There's the bone coming out. So we're going to drop it to the patient's right. Um, and then this is just uh, showing this, these cuts being made as we do this modified subdorsal strip method here, preserving that caudal strut. And then a vertical cut is going to be made to allow it to flex. Sometimes you can mark it with a needle. Here's this, there's this cartilage coming out. In younger patients, the cartilage actually extends way up underneath the dorsal hump, way beyond the uh, rhinion. And so in those patients, really um, very little to no bony removals re is required. Here I'm using a through biter. This is over a year ago. So nowadays I just cut the bone. I don't even, I don't even really remove any because I don't want to uh, have a step. And I often don't even need to do the, oste the ostetone uh, that you just saw there. I don't have to do that. And this is just suture securing it. So I'm going to keep going in the interest of time here. So this is the diagram. So the, the right side, you can see the ostectomy to shift everything to that side. I took a septal extension graft and used that uh, on the right side to set the midline also because the nose was deviated. And there's a little bit of, this is, this is a profile view uh, relatively early. And there's an improvement in symmetry. There's still a little bit of a deficiency on the right mid vault, but I think it's, it's okay given the amount of uh, movement we did get, and here's the base view. Uh, and these are the scores uh, postoperatively, preoperatively, and postoperatively. No aesthetic uh, issues and uh, airways fine. Another crooked nose. Uh, and this patient's interesting because she had a kind of narrow um, posterior portion of the bony vault. Um, she didn't really care so much about the hump, but I told her that might have to change as we rotate her to the right. And so I did the similar procedure. She needed an SEG, so structural work around the tip is the same as we would do, um, but the osseo, the way it treated the osseocartilaginous vault was preservation. Uh, and so here she is post-op, she's much straighter, still relatively early, and the hump's gone, but that wasn't her main concern. Base view. And here she is with her uh, Schnauz scores preoperatively and postoperatively. Uh, and I think this is the last preservation, or this next to last preservation patient I'm going to show you. Um, and I think we're still on time here. The, this patient wanted some, some tip work and a, a slight dorsal hump. This is a great patient for preservation. She's got pretty good dorsal aesthetic lines, a gentle hump, really good to flex down with this method. And her tip, she's got pretty thick skin, um, but she wants it a bit narrower. And so in her, it's, it's structural preservation and, and the structural part is septal extension grafting, tongue and groove, and cephalic, hinge cephalic turn-ins, which uh, we described in 2010. Uh, or 2009, sorry. And this is just showing that, I'm gonna speed through it a little bit. This is um, a longer video, but this is showing the important concept of where the skin transitions to very thick. I like to mark this in patients with thick skin because her the skin is actually very dorsum, is very thin dorsally, but it's very thick right at that transition point. And so we're gonna do our modified subdorsal strip method and drop her into position um, as, I, as I showed earlier. And so these are our uh, osteotomies and ostectomies. I'm going to skip through that a little bit to some of the tip work that I want to show you. And this is doing just a little release of that, of that w, w area of the lower cartilages, the, I'm sorry, the upper cartilages. Uh, this is doing our cartilage cuts for the modified subdorsal strip method. Taking that little segment out. This is suturing in a position. This is putting the upper dorsal suture. Um, and this is what I want to show you. This is the, the hinge flap uh, technique. So back in 2009, uh, Dr. Murakami, my, one of my mentors, and I wrote a paper about uh, cephalic turn-ins. And that was, um, I believe, the first paper on that. Um, and subsequent to that, my colleague, uh, Dr. Sazgar in uh, Tehran, 
spent a year and a half with me. We wrote a paper about what he had originally described, which was a modification called a hinge flap. And that's whereby you don't dissect any mucosa underneath. You just simply cut it and allow it to sort of hinge underneath and suture in position. It's really good for strengthening because you don't uh, co-apt it uh, directly, but you keep that whole scroll spring intact and allow it to keep that airway open. And so you can do this in a way that um, looks very natural uh, and doesn't need mini lateral curl strut grafting or anything like that. So this is the first part. Uh, and then intradomal sutures are placed. I like to mark that carefully. I'm going to skip through that just a little bit. Tongue and groove is then done, which we've already talked about. So we'll skip through that. This is the tongue and groove going in. So you can see those lateral curl now are a little bit more angulated now that they've had the dome sutures put in and they're also supported. Um, but this bi-directional uh, control of the tip by pushing it in with the tongue and groove and then pushing it down slightly with the ailer spanning suture is something that I really like to do. If you just do the tongue and groove or just do rotation maneuvers without controlling that super tip, they can look a little operated on. And, and this looks uh, much more natural and gives you better definition in your tip. Everything's about precision and measuring everything carefully. The suture I mattress uh, across that went through the septum and then goes back not going through the septum. And this flattens those lateral cura as long as they're strong enough and with those hinge flaps they are. And it allows you to get a good position in your tip. And then so uh, Ehler base excisions, I'm not gonna talk about too much, but here she is at the end with the tape going on. And she's a little bit swollen, but her tip is in much better shape. And so this is using preservation methods with uh, structural tip work. Uh, and here's her uh, side view, here's her three quarters view, frontal view. You can see the improvement in the tip there in dorsal aesthetic lines, which I'm really happy about. Close up frontal view uh, and base view. And this is where she went from her uh, preoperative to postoperative scores. And one, uh, this, this case, I think that we're gonna try to finish up. So this is another one, um, maybe not the best case for preservation because she has a low radix, but someone I wanted to try this on, slight asymmetry, poor tip support, using structural preservation um, with the osteocartilaginous vault uh, preservation. And then these other techniques, mini lateral curl strut grafts, uh, and other things in tongue and groove, of course, to control the tip and get it in a better position. Um, here she is nine months postoperatively. Uh, no makeup on the right screen because of COVID now. She's not, she's not wearing her eyelashes or any makeup. Uh, and here she is in her three quarters view, uh, frontal view, and close up frontal view. And so much better tip definition. And, and you know, that supporting that kind of tip is really challenging as you saw in the smiling photos, and getting that kind of tip rotation and tip confirmation. I can only do with structural approaches for me. Um, and so for me, structural preservation rhinoplasty is the new thing uh, that combines some of the best of the things that I've learned in the past 18 years. Uh, and it means osteocartilaginous vault preservation. I use my modified subdorsal strip method. It works for me. Uh, and you can combine it with all the other things. Of course, there are many more things than is shown here that you can do. Um, for your patients in the tip to control the tip tripod. So these are really important concepts for me as I practice medicine in primary rhinoplasty, even revision rhinoplasty. Uh, and they're just more tools that I have in my toolbox. Um, if I have a couple more, two more minutes, I wanna show you one last case to combine a little bit more of everything. And this is an interesting case um, because, you know, as facial plastic surgeons, we take care of a lot of different things. And one big part of my practice is uh, skin cancer reconstruction. and Sometimes you have to take concepts from one area of facial plastic surgery and apply them to others. And this is a, uh, was going to be a fifth revision rhinoplasty patient who visited many surgeons around the country and came to me, is missing the skin of the tip of his nose because it was infected and the graft was infected and came out the tip of his nose. And I told him, I can't do your rhinoplasty unless I replace the skin on the tip of your nose. And he said, how are you gonna do that? And I said, it's a forehead flap. You need a forehead flap. Um, and he said, You're, you know, there's no way in heck I'm gonna let you do that. And he left, you know, he was nice, but he came back, you know, about a year later and after having been around and decided it was the right way to go. And then I thought, oh boy, now I have to put my money where my mouth is and do this um, on a cosmetic patient. But, you know, if you use your um, concepts of aesthetic subunits of the nose, 
uh, you can do it. So the first part was I want to get the infected foreign bodies out. So I did that. Um, and then the next part is recreate the skin envelope with a forehead flap. Um, and I placed a little spacer graft of ear cartilage underneath there. And using the subunit principle that my, my friend who's now passed away, Gary Burgett, um, really espoused, look at the tip, tip subunit and decide where the shadow lines are for the tip and recreate it. Uh, and so you have to cut out some normal skin in addition to the scar and then hope that you're right <laughs> because uh, there's no going back once you do that. And this cartilage graph, so you can see a little bit of ear I just put there just to kind of to give the contour because if you just put the flap on there, it'll be flat. It won't be enough three-dimensionally to give you the curvature you need. Um, and so here he is with this and he's trusting me and he's actually an excellent patient, took care of this his wounds very well, uh, very meticulously. So we do the forehead flap, stage one, stage two. So now we've done three surgeries so far. About six months later, come back for prime, you know, revision rhinoplasty to rebuild some of the tip uh, support and get it to the contour he wants. So he needed anterior septal reconstruction with autologous rib. Uh, it's a little bit of tip grafting and, and rim grafting. And I tried to reduce his dorsum a little bit. Um, and so here he is postoperatively, and, and the skin texture is a little different in the tip. You can see it's less porous because it came from his forehead. Um, his forehead scar, which is just to the left of the M and my name, MD, it's not covered, uh, looks really good. You can see on the three quarters view, it shows a little more. You can see a little shadow there. Sorry about my name there. But his scar is done very well. And as more importantly, his nose is done really well. His tip is back in the right position. Um, and his dorsum is still a little high. He didn't want me to take it down too much because he liked it. But there's no way you can do this without replacing skin. Um, and I think that the bottom line is that, uh, you know, you can apply uh, concepts of skin reconstruction or things like that to your patients if you need to. Here's an up close uh, frontal view of him. So finally, just again, I just want to reiterate, I've gone through a lot. Um, I've talked a lot about my philosophy for rhinoplasty. Um, and uh, I hope you understand a little bit about the way I think about it. Aesthetics and function are critical. As you saw, every patient that I see is evaluated for both. Uh, and structural preservation is really the, the way I go now for most of my dorsal hump reductions. And it combines preservation of the osteocartilaginous fault with structural tip tripod techniques and with an external approach. And the paper on this is coming out soon, hopefully. Um, and so it's all of these techniques and more uh, that you may be already doing uh, that you can combine with osteocartilaginous fault preservation. And if patients have really nice, uh, really nice dorsal aesthetic lines uh, and a gentle curve, it just now it seems like a shame to destroy it uh, and rebuild it. Um, it can work. I did it for 18 years. I still do it in the right patients, but I think this is another tool to have in your toolbox. So functional aesthetic surgery of the nose is part of a continuum um, and they're interrelated, must always be considered in the framework and extra lining or you know, would give you your light and shadow and the internal lining is a lot, has a lot to do with the airway, but they're all interrelated and you have to think about all of them. But most importantly for the young surgeons out there and uh, the old surgeons like me, um, older surgeons, you know, I hope you do not stop learning and innovating. Um, if you told me five years, 10 years ago that I would be doing the structural preservation thing, I would have told you you're crazy, but don't be afraid to try new things. Never be satisfied with what you see other people say like me, or anyone else, think about it critically and think about how maybe you can do things better and ask the tough questions, which I'm expecting here in a couple minutes, um, and uh, keep trying to get better. This is, my, um, this is my contact information if anyone wants to get a hold of me. Uh, and um, I want to thank you very much again uh, for having me here. Uh, it's been uh, a real pleasure and just a few photos of a few of the people that I got to meet uh, when, I, uh, when I went down uh, to uh, Brazil three years ago. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Most. Dr. Most, thank you again. Uh, it was an outstanding lecture and we are all excited after this lecture, but because all of your basement, your scientific basement, we've all, you, you must be one of the, the facial plastic surgeons that pub publish so many papers. 
uh, when you you do a search on on the PubMed, you have more than 140 papers that you publish, and it's awesome. Uh, and then we are really excited about this structure, structural preservation technique, and maybe we we'll want to to initiate the, this technique here in Brazil too, following our our past masters uh, like Dr. Davis and Dr. Jurado yes. that, that yes, was here. Yes, who've been doing the preservation. You know, yeah. This isn't, For many years. this isn't necessarily something new, but it's a new concept of thinking about combining preservation of the awesome yeah. ledge as well with all the structural techniques that, you know, people do. So that's it's more of a way of thinking about it that I, I do now. And I'd like, you know, to try to introduce people to thinking about it that way. Because before yeah. I think people were thinking you have to do one or the other, uh, but I think you can combine it. That's what I've been doing and, and it seems to work. Yeah, and it's great. It's great. With all with all of these awesome results, but uh, I'd like to to do maybe one technique question and one not technique question. Uh, here in the Federal University of São Paulo, we had some prospective studies on the nasal valve and relation with uh, the obstructive apnea, sleep apnea, mm -hmm. and we use all of this papers that you already published and all of these concepts that you that you talk here in this lecture but i'd like to know why do you prefer the lateral crew strut graft to correct the the zone to wave valve insufficiency instead the other batten what what's the reason to do you think that the, this is better result with the, the lateral, lateral stretch graft. Yeah, I'm, I think you mean zone one, but so the- Zone, zone one, sir, yeah. I, you know, the way I think, think about it, and, and the reason why I never really was happy with batten grafts, is that to me, if a, for example, you know, a trampoline, if you have a trampoline, and the middle of the trampoline is too loose, it's going up and down too much, if you take a piece of wood and put it in the, from the middle of the trampoline to one edge, it's not gonna be as good as if you put one from the edge to edge all the way across. For me, a batten graft doesn't go all, you know, it usually doesn't go all the way from the anterior part uh, with the septum is, all the way across to the, to the, to the bone. Um, it usually floats in the middle or just sitting out laterally. The lateral curl strut for airway for airway reconstruction really should go from a very stable point medially to a stable point laterally, uh, and so it doesn't have to always go to the septum because if where the where the medial crew where the where the, the dome is sometimes the cartilage is pretty stiff, you know a few millimeters out so it doesn't have to go all the way but as long as it goes from that stiff point all the way to the to the piriform aperture, then it should be much better to me but. The, the, con the, the pitfall is if you make it too thick. Uh, if you make it too wide, then it's just gonna block the airway anyway. Yeah. Um, and I think you have to make sure it's thin and strong. Septal cartilage works great. Rib cartilage is tougher. You have to really cut it very finely. And the other aspect of it is you have to, you have to bevel the leading edge of the cartilage that's facing anteriorly uh, into the vestibular mucosa so that it is smooth. Otherwise there's a, it's a thick edge and, and it, it you know, bothers patients. They can feel it, but if it's, if it's a gradual edge, they won't, it won't bother them so much. Um, so that's why I don't really like battens. But you know, I, like I said, so many things that we do work for some people, don't work for others. Maybe I'm not doing them correctly. Maybe if you put a batten all the way across, it would work better. But I find that I can just do it with the lateral curl struck graph. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Most. And the other non-technique question is about the social media. We all have this on these times and especially on these quarantine times, I, I guess that the, the use of the social media is getting stronger and harder. And I want to know, I know you were on, on Instagram and you had more than 20,000 followers and my contact with you is first, firstly was by Instagram 
and uh, I'd like to know what uh, what what do you see that is a positive, uh, a good a good uh, result or a good reason for use the social media, and the bad things using the social media as a facial plastic surgeon that you have nowadays. Well, you know it's. <laughs> I've been around long enough that I, I remember when I first started practice, most plastic surgeons did not have a website even. And when plastic surgeons started having websites, most of the medical establishment thought that was really beneath them. It was terrible. Um, you know, why would you want to promote yourself that way? And of course, everybody on their website was an internationally world never not expert. You know, all you have to do is write it and everybody believes it. So that was the problem. Um, and then there's, new media is coming out all the time. Then it was YouTube, which is a for, form of social media. People started posting there. I, um, I joined Instagram um, in August of 2017, just about three years, almost three years ago. And it was because my patients were asking me, you know, where are your patients on Instagram and the younger patients especially. So I think we have to evolve. Um, I don't really update my website very much anymore, you know, because it's just a hassle. And you have to have somebody do it for you and it's not as responsive. So an advantage of Instagram is that you can, you know, it's very easy to do. I, I have a background in uh, more of a hobby in graphic design anyway, so I can do all that stuff very easily and post it very quickly. Um, the downsides are, of course, you have to have patient permission um, and people are mean on, on social media. So people will say awful things, you know, about anything that, you know, as you know, Twitter, and I don't use really Twitter much, but so you have to be really careful. You monitor the comments or have someone doing it for you. Um, just make sure you do that. Uh, and, but I, what I like about it is it allows me to show a little bit about me personally, maybe my personality a little bit. Um, and I think it's reflective of that. And the website really doesn't do that. So there's a little bit of a personal, I think, Patients know a little bit about me when they come in, uh, and I kind of like that, uh, frankly, but you know, not too much. I don't really post anything too private, but just you know, a little bit of stuff, fun things here and there. And you can show your personality a little bit, and I think that's nice. Um, and I think that the fact that you can do things very quickly, it's nice you can post videos and you know, results and things like that on there. I think it's, it's fine, but you know, new things are coming out all the time. Now, people are doing TikTok. I don't do that. I don't really understand it. Someone can explain it to me. Uh, and other things, you know, I'm sure there'll be something new. Uh, people do, did Snapchat for a while. I never did that. I don't have an account. I don't know. I, I'm not really that, that savvy on all the things, but uh, I think that you just have to keep up with the times to a certain extent. As long as you're ethical about what you post, get permissions from your patients, um, don't say things that aren't true, and you're honest about stuff, it's, it's, not, it's not bad. Okay, thank you for sharing your experience. Uh, I'd like to ladies first, so Natalia Coronel, please. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Aldo, for the best, best schedule of classes during this quarantine. It's a pleasure to participate in this class. And congratulations, Dr. Most, for the, this brilliant class. And uh, this topic is especially good to discuss. And I consider that is the starting point for planning a surgery, a rhinoplasty. And I have two questions for you. The first one is about auto spreader graft in particular. I have a question. Um, considering that the thickness of the upper lateral cartilage is approximately half of the septal cartilage mm -hmm. that we use in conventional spreader graft, when I use auto spreader graft, uh, I have difficult reaching the width I want in the middle third, third. Usually I find it easier with spreader grafts and uh, I end up using a lot more the conventional of spreader grafts. Mm -hmm. So how do you control the width uh, of the middle third of the nose when using our spreader graft? And how do you usually, uh, how wide do you usually leave the middle third in your patients? Let me um, answer that as follows. You know, um, I think you're right. So there are different ways of doing auto spreaders or whatever you want to call them, uh, spreader flaps. And one thing to remember is it's, it's the contour that you're left with that's more important. Okay, so the, when, you do a, when you do a upper lateral cartilage resection and you put spreader grafts, it's because the width of those upper lats are narrow and you can just suture them across, it'll be too narrow, right? Yes. I want to show uh, this real quick. Can you see this? Yeah. Yes. 
So as I mentioned before, I put a suture simply down here below and it doesn't really show here so much, but in the video would have this, can you see my mouse moving around? Yeah. yeah. So the junction here to the bone is often a little wider and this upper lateral cartilage is still attached. And this has a spring effect and stays kind of wide. So it doesn't collapse into a single narrow structure, the, which is double the width of the upper lateral cartilage. It's actually wider than that. And people who do this without scoring it, it really stays wide actually. And, and so that's one reason why I don't put the sutures up here. I used to suture all the way across and that makes it too narrow. So by leaving, putting one simple suture here, a mattress suture, and leaving this, it actually springs open and gives you a nice uh, width. And it sort of naturally conforms to what the width of the bones is, where, where you've set the bones. Um, and so uh, that's how I get around the issue that you're talking about. Now, if somebody has an asymmetric, um, oops, sorry. I'm back now, am I back? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you if you have an asymmetric uh, dorsal septum, then you may need to use a spreader graft in addition to an auto spreader graft, and I would do that. Um, but uh, you're right that the width of that would be too narrow if you collapsed it and sutured it all the way up. But I don't suture it all the way up, and so that doesn't seem to be an issue. And people who don't score it, it really stays wide. They just put a couple sutures and it's sort of curved, going all the way up. So uh, that's one way around it too. Okay, thank you. Does that and, make sense? Uh, yes. The second question is, uh, which is which is the biggest mistake, uh, in your opinion, in diagnosing lateral wall insufficiency? Ah, I'm glad you asked that. The biggest mistake is how whether you should be treating it or not. Okay, whether it's pathologically significant. People will take a curet, ear curet or a Q-tip and lateralize the nasal wall and say and ask the patient if they breathe better and they say yes i can guarantee you try it in the next 10 patients and all 10 of them will say they breathe better even yeah. if they don't have lateral wall insufficiency okay so that's not a very specific test it's a very sensitive test because everybody's positive but it's not a very specific test for treating that and this is one thing that i was teaching i was involved not anymore that's why it's not in my disclosures with this device for lateral wall insufficiency. Um, and when I was teaching them how to select patients and how their representatives in the community should select patients is, you know, if somebody has LWI and you think it's a problem, put your curette in there and just stabilize the nasal wall. Okay, don't push it out. And ask them to breathe and prevent it from falling in and see if they feel better. If they feel better, they're a good candidate for some sort of lateral wall repair. If they don't, if they say, you know, eh, no big, I don't really feel a difference, don't do it because they're not gonna, it's not gonna help them. And I can't tell you how often this happens. I think the teaching is the modified caudal maneuver is to pull here or to put in a Q-tip and do this. That, you know, I have not seen a surgical procedure that duplicates that, excepting high septal deviations that you get rid of because when you do this, you're just pulling the lateral wall away from it. That's not really LWI. If a person has LWI and you put that Q-tip in or whatever, and you stabilize it and it doesn't fall in and they feel better, that's a good candidate to do some sort of repair on. That's the biggest mistake in that to me by far. Thank you. Who can, who want to talk now, please? Hi, you talk. Dr. Washington, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. From Bahia. Bahia. Thank you, Aldo. Thank you, Camila. From Northeast of Brazil. Bahia. Nerdy. Thank you, Aldo and Camila Leo, for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And congratulations, Dr. Samos, for excellent speech, as usual. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you mentioned in the case that you, beautiful case that you showed that the reposition, 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 of the lateral plural. And I think uh, one of the most uh, problems that you have when you reposition the, the lateral plural is the symmetry. I'd like to know how to avoid the asymmetry when you do that. And another question is mm -hmm. I, I, you did a lot of later, uh, uh, plural overlay. Mm -hmm. You don't like to do a uh, lateral steel? 
And use lateral tension of the lateral curl? Um, I do lateral curl still. Um, I don't necessarily do tensioning all the time. Uh, if you're referring to extending a septal extension graft and tensioning the lateral curl to it, yeah. um, I, when I see that, again, I like to be skeptical and I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but I think about what it would be like if I tried it. If I tried doing an end-to-end -end lateral, I mean, an end-to-end -end septal extension graft and then tensioned these mm -hmm. things to it, I am almost positive that, I would be, that it would sway to one side or the other over time. And I can tell you that I've been asked to revise several cases like that from around the country. So I don't trust the hockey stick end-to-end -end septal extension graft with tension, equal tensioning to stay stable over time in, in the midline. Yeah, so I, I like to tension the lateral curl sometimes, and I'll do lateral curl steel, but I don't rely on that exclusively to straighten the lateral curl. I will do something called a mini lateral curl strut graft, which is about a one centimeter graft right in the, in the super tip area. And we, we just published a paper about that, but um, it's similar to doing the turn in, you know, just strengthening that and straightening out that area with an Ehlers spanning suture. I find that works better. Also, if you don't want to project somebody more, you can't really do the tensioning thing. So it doesn't really work. Um, let me tell you about, I'm going to show you this. I, I showed this very briefly, but didn't talk about it because it wasn't the topic of this uh, patient's discussion. It was more about tongue and groove, but this is showing lateral curl repositioning. Can you see this? Yes. <clears throat> so uh, this is something I started doing about eight, nine years ago, um, and that is to use a PDS suture. And now I don't do two, I just do one. If you take a PDS suture and place it into uh, the end of the reconstructed segment, and then pass it through your pocket out the skin. You can either tie, put a tape here or something. And I put, you can see those purple dots here. I like to measure, I measure it precisely on both sides, exactly where I want it to be in the pocket. This will make sure that it's symmetric. Uh, and it's, to me, again, when I, when I was watching Dean and other people talk about lateral curl repositioning, just like I was saying, I was thinking about how I would do it. My, the problem I had with it was just what you said. How is it going to be symmetric? This is such a destructive procedure. How are you going to ensure that it's going to stay symmetric over time? So this is what I just came up with. Uh, and I haven't published this, it's just a technical thing, but I've talked about it for many years. I think putting this PDS suture in, and these double arm 4 PDSs are nice, go right in the pocket and then pass it in through there and, and then just tape it to the skin for the first week. And it holds it in that pocket so it stays there for that week, at least it doesn't drift. Uh, and I think that really helps and I really, when I do this, I don't really seem to have a problem, knock on wood, uh, with, uh, with asymmetry. Uh, and so that's, that's what I like to do for that. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. I'm glad you guys have got, we got perfect questions here. That's what I like to talk about. <laughs> Let me Bell. ask you something, Bell? two questions for you. Yeah. Thank you, so Dr. Patrocinio. Yes, the first one is about septal station graft. Why do you prefer uh, side to side and not end to end, or sometimes you do a, a end to end? Very rarely do I do end to end. Um, I mean, I, I'm saying that I just did two today <laughs> on revisions, uh, but um, actually one end, one side to side, one end to end. Uh, Mostly because, you know, I'm, I'm fine doing end-to-end -end if it's perfectly straight down the midline and I can put two spreader graphs on there and hold it all in position, that's fine. I just don't like doing the hockey stick ones that stick up way anteriorly and then you put little splinting graphs on there and tension to it because I think it's going to move side to side. Having said that, I still think doing a side-to-side -side coaptation with three sutures is much stronger than end-to-end -to -end with two spreader graphs. Don't you have a, a septal deviation? If you have a septal, uh, you mean you mean if you put a, a side to side? Well, so there's some ways, there are nuances. So it's very common for the very caudal septum to be slightly off the midline. So when I look, um, I look for where it's off the midline. I stand at the top with the medial curve split, and I have a mark in the in the cupid's bow, and I look exactly where it is, and I say it's a little bit to the left, it's a little bit to the right. I put the acceptable extension graft on the other side of that, and I make sure that is sitting in the midline. That's usually not a problem. 
and like I said, we just have a paper accepted um, looking at 70 patients with septal extension grafts side to side. And we actually did a cohort analysis where we compared them to exactly matched patients with the same procedures who, um, who didn't have the SEG. And the cohort analysis shows there's no difference in nasal obstruction problems or anything in those, which is one of the main things, or asymmetry. I think just like anything else, it works for me. And, and I just have to be really careful that that midline of the caudal, uh, the septal extension, the caudal edge of it is in the midline. Uh, and if the patient has a perfectly midline septum, then there's two choices. One is to do end to end, like you said, with two spreader graphs, which I do. Um, it's hardly, it's very rare to have a perfectly straight septum right down the midline. Second is you can actually, if you take the septum off the maxillary crest and you cut it longitudinally and look at it, it has a little bend at the end because it's wider at the bottom. So you can actually, and it's very thin right above that, you can actually suture that to the caudal edge of a perfectly straight septum and it will wrap around to the midline where the caudal and, edge and, and do you fix at the premaxilla also? No. Just like I fix it to the caudal to the caudal septum with three sutures. And the second question is, I don't know anyone in U.S. performing push down except you. Don't you afraid they're gonna kill you? <laughs> no, I can name two people who are doing it. Uh, also, Aaron Cousins was a plastic general plastic surgeon in uh, Southern Cal. He's friend, you know, he's like uh, Roland Daniels' good friend, and he, he's a great guy. He's doing him. Yeah, and a guy in uh, Oren Friedman, you know Oren. Oren's yeah. been doing him probably longer than just about anybody because he trained with Gene Kern, or he didn't train with Gene Kern, but when he was at Mayo Clinic, Gene was there and, and they became friends and he showed him how to do the caudal method. So those guys have both been doing it. Aaron's been doing it just a little bit longer than me, not that much longer. Uh, and Oren's been doing it for 15 years. My Oren was uh, I didn't really know, I didn't really know Oren was doing it, yeah. Or he was training with Ted Cook. Yeah, he trained there, but when he went, his first job was with, um, in Mayo oh, yeah. Clinic with Gene Kern. And so Gene showed him how. Gene learned directly from Maurice Cottle. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Great, great job. You'll we'll, we'll have more than 350 people watching you. That's yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, really, it's, a great, it's great to see everybody. May I ask a, a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Please, Dr. Sam. Um, I've seen it, when you do the um, repositioning of the lateral crura, uh, you usually measure, I do the same, and I usually uh, measure about seven to eight millimeters from the outer margin to that uh, stitch. Do you think it's a good measure or, or do you use something different? Um, you know, I really, I, so Dean talks about this, and this is what I like to do. I like to create the pocket pretty far caudally, um, but leave some soft tissue so that'll push the caudal edge of the alar rim down. But I do pretty far, go pretty far caudally. Um, I don't make the measurement like you did. I mean, that's an interesting one, and maybe I should start measuring. I usually just honestly just put the dots where I want them to be symmetrically. I, I'm more worried about the symmetry part, um, but I don't measure that. That's a good, that's a good idea. Um, yes, I, I do a pocket. Uh, I start the pocket from seven millimeters from the outer margin, so it stays uh, at the same uh, the same place bilaterally. Yeah, I think I'm a little closer than that. You really save. You're saving a lot of soft tissue. Yeah, uh, I, go, I go a little bit closer. You know what I do, and I should do a video of this sometime. Um, I use a I use a little ear uh, beaver blade, a sixty seven hundred blade, when I do my incisions in rhinoplasty. And so I, I actually use that blade to make the pocket. You just pass oh, yeah. it in and it's very sharp. It just makes the pocket right down oh. very much easier than a scissor. Uh, and then I place it down there. So yeah, but, you know, that's very interesting. I think we all do things that kind of work for us. And... Yeah, and, and may I ask you another question? Uh, I've seen you, you like to use uh, the extracorporeal septoplasty, but leaving uh, some septum, uh, next to the to the bone, and do you still use sometimes the total extracorporeal septoplasty? Almost never. Almost never. <laughs> Almost never. I mean, I can't remember the last time I needed to do that. Um, 
because uh, you can do anything you want with this still. I mean, if you have a high septal deviation there or something's asymmetric, you can still put spreader graphs. I do, we just, we published a paper with like 100 dorsal hump reductions or something with, I don't remember the number actually, a uh, number of dorsal hump reductions, but doing Joseph technique with, um, with this too, just saving that little dorsal segment. And you can put spreader graphs next to it if you're worried about still residual asymmetry on the bones and things. So, and it makes it so much easier to reconstruct. Yeah. Um, then passing, you know, the drill through and doing the suture like Sebastian and Wolfgang do, which works great. The problem yeah. is, again, the higher incidence, I think, of irregularities. Yeah. And yeah, also, I mean, almost, they almost always put, um, put paste of cartilage or something over the top to hide it at the end. Okay. And you don't need to do that with this because you're preserving it. Yes. And you can yeah. solve you know, 99% of the airway issues and everything with, without taking it all out. And avoiding having a step between the, the, yeah. the bone and the cartilage. Yeah, and, and you know, I started doing this out of necessity in the early 2000s when I published that paper. It was just like, I thought maybe I would let people know what I'm doing, but um, it's really been great because uh, it's made a big difference in my practice. And, and um, so it's, it's preserving it makes a big difference. And I don't think there's a really a big downside. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Marcelo Zanini, do you want to do some questions? You need to turn on your mic. Turn on your microphone. Chama seu filho lá. There we go. That's oh, it. Oh. <laughs> no? Call your son. To... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now we're here, you. Uh, congratulations. Ex excellent, excellent uh, explanation, excellent videos. Um, yeah, yeah, you remember uh, last time we, we met in, in Florianópolis, in Brazilian yes. Congress, thousands yeah. of um my questions are just uh, already um, uh, done but um, uh, i presume uh, you um, you do many surgeon cocogenosis and um, about numbers uh, about um, lottery uh, lottery insufficiency uh, how many cases you do uh you need to to improve uh preform aperture uh, in your um, statistic you know i haven't done much piriform aperture work i know that's something that are you referring to widening the piriform aperture the bony aperture yeah yeah to to, to uh, a large yes you know i i don't really do that i know people have described that um, and I know that, for example, my colleagues here in sleep surgery do palatal expansion and move everything, um, which seems to help the valve. Uh, but I don't really have experience with it, uh, honestly. So I don't, I haven't done that. Okay. Okay. And uh, um, about the, to, to use the fascia, the temporal fascia, um, above the nasal vault, when you do a traditional Joseph rhinoplasty, uh, do you do you use uh, a lot or not? I used to, and I used to get consent for temporalis fascia on every hump reduction, and my staff knew that they were supposed to do that for every patient. And I ended up doing it about five to ten percent of the time. What I found was it usually goes away, uh, and especially if you just use a single layer. I think if you double or triple it, then it's okay. What I use now, honestly, if there's an issue, I use mastoid periosteum. Uh, and it seems to last longer. In fact, if you even want just one millimeter of dorsal augmentation, um, and I just did this last week in a revision rhinoplasty, I will take uh, mastoid periosteum with a little bit of the soft tissue on top of it, and that seems to really last. I don't know why. I think, I think the temporalis fascia is a great. Is great. Um, I've even used fascia lata from the leg, 
Uh, but I, I find that um, I, think it, I think it goes away, unless you really just have a tiny little defect or something, I, I don't think it's gonna give you that much. I've rolled it really thick and placed it in the radix for radix graphs, and that seems to be okay. You overcorrect and it comes down. But I was disappointed over the years, and I have no quantitative data to show this, but I was disappointed with temporalis fascia longevity. And, that, and about the dice it. Dice cartilage? I like dice cartilage a lot. I, it seems to work really well for me the way I do it. I just did one today, actually. So um, you can make it very thin if you just want one millimeter. You can make it fat if you want a lot. It seems to last. The technical aspects of that are you just really need to dice it less than one millimeter. And it, I, I look at it very carefully with my loops and I spread it out. And if I see anything, I drop it more. Um, I've seen photographs in papers and things, presentations where people have giant chunks of cartilage. And I think that that's going to leave you know, irregularities. And, and actually patients now come to me, you know, and, and they say, I don't want you to do that because I've seen people do this, stretch their skin, and you can see all the little chunks of cartilage. And I tell them, you know, that's because it's not being diced enough. Um, but, you know, with the world we live in now, people know about this stuff. <laughs> So you have to really dice it very well if you're going to use it. And um, we're going to we're going to do an analysis of like eight, nine years of dicing cartilage, I think, soon uh, and show the size. Like it stays like a cobblestone. Yeah, if it's too big, if it's too big. Doctor, um, about the banner graft, uh, don't you use anymore? The, I'm sorry, the witch grafts? Banner graft to banner. Oh, Batten grafts. Batten. I didn't really, uh, you know, I um, never really was a big fan. Batten, I don't, Batten, Batten. Yes, yes, uh, Batten grafts. I'm not a big fan of the Batten grafts. I just don't think physically they're going to do enough. I'd like to do lateral curl stair grafts instead. Uh, don't use anymore. You know, I never really did. I, I, I started to early in my career, in my first couple of years, early like 2002 or something, but I, I didn't find that they worked very well. So I, I, maybe, again, it could be the way I was doing it. Yeah, I think we all have biases that we develop earlier in our careers. Um, it just didn't work well for me. Okay. We had some, some questions. Some people get really good results with it. I didn't. Okay. Yeah. We had some questions from the audience, Dr. Most. Um, one question for Dr. Lissandro. He is from Goiás, uh, Midwest of Brazil. Okay. And the question is, if do you believe that the inverted V's problem is related to the upper lateral cartilage? Do you think that the, the tension of, of this inverted V patient appeared or run? If you had a, some tension on the lateral cartilage. So, um, I'm looking at the question here just so I can understand that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that, you know, an inverted V happens when there's a shadow. Okay. We're talking about a shadow from the junction of the upper lateral cartilage to the bone. And there's different ways you can get there. Um, and I think that, you know, you can, what you want is a, is a smooth transition from bone to cartilage. Uh, and, uh, there are lots of ways you can have problems. I mean, one is if you don't do any mid vault repair, as Jack Sheen showed originally when he described this, it, the upper lats start to fall down. And you can actually see this in the operating room before you do your auto spreaders. If you just, or any, whatever you're doing, just cut an upper lateral cartilage on one side and don't do the other side and just look from the top and show your residents how it's already falling in. So ten, yeah, tensioning, I guess, is part of it because if you're tensioning it back to the septum, uh, and, um, you know, any sort of repair that you do to the mid vault is going to have to, you have to make sure that your, that transition from the bone, uh, to the cartilage is smooth. Uh, if that answers the question, I think that's what Lissandro, Iron Man, Tony Stark is asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're out yes. there, hey, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Tony Stark. I, I had another question. It's from, uh, Dr. Katarina. He, she was a fellow, my fellow. Uh, how do you approach the lateral, lateral 
cartilage with inverted curvature of the lateral curl. That, yeah. That's this curvature that bulges into the nasal cavity. How do you approach yeah, this? This is actually another pitfall, I think, uh, probably relatively high on the list of pitfalls when you're doing either functional analysis or whether you're doing tip reduction. Um, when you look inside the nose, make sure you evaluate the recurvature of the lateral portion of the, of the lateral crus. Uh, and what I do sometimes is I, I take the patient and I just move the dome cartilages together. Usually people who have recurvature have very strong cartilages and you can see this parenthesis deformity on them and you move the whole thing in and these parts, which are the recurved parts come in and they block the airway. You know, so if you do dome sutures or if you do an ailer spanning suture on that patient, it's going to just collapse into the airway. Um, I have a very low threshold for amputating it right out and then put a small uh, mini lateral curl strut laterally just to stabilize it so it doesn't, you know, collapse in. So that's how I treat those now. And I, I do it very frequently. You know, if I'm, if I'm doing some tip work and narrowing a tip and they have really bad recurvature. The other thing is, you know, if you, if you do a mini, uh, the mini lateral curl strut graph in the super tip, it often flattens it out so it won't come in as much when you do the rest of your maneuvers. Uh, but you have to evaluate it after you make the tip smaller to make sure it hasn't collapsed in. And then if it's a problem, just cut it out and uh, prepare it. Yeah, I had one, on one more question. It's from Dr. Ruben. And he asks you how you measure uh, these lateral osteotomy flaps to do the, the letdown? So, um, so I showed it very briefly. I didn't actually, I showed the marks, but I didn't show how I do yeah, it. Yeah. I, I might mark the dorsal midline externally, and then I, I mark the nasofacial groove on each side. Now, of course, that's a subjective line, but as long as you're symmetric on both sides with how you mark it, then you're okay. Then you measure the distance with a ruler to the dorsal line on both sides. And usually that tells you, you know, three millimeters or whatever you need to resect on one side versus the other. And um, that seems to work. And it, it, someone, I can't remember, I saw that in a lecture. This isn't something that I came up with. This is a pretty um, standard thing that people in the letdown community, letdown community do. So, uh, so I saw that and I said, okay, that's, that's a good idea. Uh, but I just measure it externally and then decide. Yeah, yeah. Some guy asks you, what do you think about the ANSA banner concept from Dr. Carlos, Jose Carlos yeah, from know, Portugal? I see, I, think. I, see, I see Carlos you, post about that all the time. I'm trying to understand exactly what it is. <laughs> he, he says, I did an ANSA banner. No, and Carlos is a great guy. We're friends. Uh, is, that just a, is that just a septal extension graft in the tip and then he sutures to it? Yeah, yeah. I guess. Okay. That's yeah. it. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's something that a lot of people do. I don't, I don't call it answer. Yeah, yeah. And then he, he put a strut. So I don't know why they don't do a substation graph direct. Yeah, I mean, I think all of us do things a little differently, um, but some of the same concepts. Uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, Rick Davis in revision rhinoplasty is one of the big proponents of a big hockey stick septal extension graft and tensioning to it. And he's a very brilliant surgeon and he can do a really good job. But I, I have troubles, I think, thinking about how it's going to stay stable. I like to stabilize the SEG. I frequently do a suture. I'll, I'll often put the SEG a little bit higher and suture to it with my Ehler spanning sutures. That's similar, I think, to what Carlos is talking about. Um, so I think we have some similar ideas. I think one of the things I think that is most people do and don't talk about enough is that we believe in a strong uh, framework in the tip that's not over-resected. Um, because he, he says he says that uh, with this uh, the the tip is stays bobbed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the I don't know. Uh, and well, that's, uh, that's that's different. I my tips are pretty strong, uh, but yeah, I know people have good results with different things, and there are different philosophies, and yeah. a lot of it has to do with different patient types. You know, my my patient community. I showed you in that group an, a Caucasian. Um, a patient who's Turkish, a patient who is uh, of, uh, of uh, Latino, Mexican background. I showed um, a lot of different ethnicities and that reflects my practice. Actually, probably only 25% are just Caucasian. Most of them are a mix of 
Persian, Middle Eastern of some kind. You know, I showed a couple Middle Eastern patients. So I find all these anatomies are different. So when I see my friends from Istanbul showing all these Turkish patients, I think that there's some things about those patients that are advantageous and some that are disadvantageous in terms of anatomy. And I think that's true of a lot of different um, groups. Um, and so I have to adapt to all these different types. And I think that's what makes my practice fun. And uh, we've talked about how you have to do different things for different anatomical types. And there's, you know, we try not to use words like deficiency or problem. I mean, it's not really that. It's just everyone's a little different and you have to do different things to try to counteract uh, with each. That's exactly our patients here in Brazil, a mix yes, it. I know. Mixed. Of everything. Yeah. Mixed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have one la I have one last personal question, please. Uh, do you think it's possible to perform the structural pre structural preservation rhinoplast without the piezo? Uh yeah, sure. I mean you can do the the osteotomies and ostectomy. Um, you can open a nose and not elevate all the periosteum and do the osteotomies and ostectomy um, the standard way. Okay. Um, I like using the piezo now. I mean, I think in the last five years, the two biggest changes in my practice were using piezo and, and doing the preservation, dorsal preservation, but um, you can do it. I, I still do that once in a while. I have to teach them how to use, I teach my fellows how to use osteotomes. <laughs> Otherwise, they, they won't know how. They just only know how to use the piezo. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's really, that's a shame. That really isn't good because I was pretty good at osteotomes too. I still am, but uh, you should have that skill. No, you absolutely can do that. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone wants to do more questions? No, just congratulated him. Yeah, yeah. It was a great time here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, you know, I want to thank all of you uh, so much. Thank for you so me. much. Um, Aldo, good to see you again. And thanks for having me and organizing this. Thank you to all of you uh, very much. I hope to see you in person, um, either here in the US and San Francisco and Palo Alto or down in Brazil at some point soon. Just be careful, be safe. Oh, a, a, less, a less question. How many, how many talks did you give during the <laughs> pandemic? You know, what's Hundreds. A more question, what's a more important question is how do I get my hair cut? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many talks I get a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> guys, take care. Thank you so much for having me. I know it must be very late for you. Well, well um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sam. Uh, it's almost uh, two hours of discussion about uh, rhinoplasty, static and functional. So it was great. We have many people at attend, many participants from different countries. So the large number of participants. And it was uh, really amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Sam Mons, for a fantastic talk. You know it's not my field, but I understood all. Uh, <laughs> you almost are lying. all. Almost you are all. Lying. Almost all. <laughs> understand, understand is one thing. To do is different situation. <laughs> Very important comment is. Yeah. So thank you, you all, uh, the participants, moderate, and all the panelists for joining us. I really enjoy a lot. Uh, our special thanks for uh, uh, Gravason. Gravason is is the the people from Marcelo that was a sponsor for the translation. It was really good as usual. Uh, I'd like to announce uh, our next meeting. Uh, it's a, a, presence, a presidential uh, meeting. Uh, you postponed for 2022. Uh, it was initially scheduled for next year, but you postponed for 2002, uh, of course, due to this, all this uh, uh, pandemic situation. So and, uh, I'd like to announce uh, our next, our next uh, international uh, live stream. It will be next next uh, Thursday, at 8 p.m. again, with Professor Darren Birsetti from Singapore. Uh, he'll talk about the start, how are we starting, how it was involved in the past 25 years. It was a great lecture. It's most for uh, general uh, ENT people. Thank you very much, uh, Camila. Thank you very much, all. And uh, I hope to see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great night. It was a